All right, hello and welcome back to another video on Nova GS, and specifically on sockets. So the last model, I look at GraphQL, which is a new way of building front-end and back-end applications. It's a new query language. That the beauty of GraphQL is to see how different pieces of data in your server relate each other. It all started with GraphQL. It all start describing your data using schemas, and when you want to ask for the data, you use GraphQL queries. And these queries is much like selecting property of an object. And you may wonder why do we need to do this? Uh, what is why this is helpful? Because the GraphQL query really match closely what the return option will get, we can predict what our query will return. And that includes is the property fields, uh, regardless how the data is stored, and we get it back as a JSON. So I saw how, <clears throat> sorry, so I saw who made that, uh, Facebook in 2012, see the specifications and the client side libraries for React frameworks such as Relay and more high end products such as Graph Apollo, where they offer you a front end and back end among other integrations. So, understand GraphQL is important specifically at what are the problems it solves? So you have is the overfetching and underfetching. So overfetching means that anytime we make requests, additionally requests to to query multiple collection of value, we lose time making the low way or the low page time to increase being necessary. Whereas the Overfetching is any time you ask data to your server, the server sending back huge amount of data that you're, that you're not going to need it. It sends you a huge amount of data that you're not going to use it and you have to filter out in the browser. So GraphQL solves this issue by just having one single entry point where it allows you to add the data that you want and you hopefully get back that. It also comes with some other advantage such as schema and types and the speed of the development process. The disadvantage is that because this flexibility adds complexity and it's not a restful architecture which most developers are familiar with, so the learning curve might be quite steep to learn Catching is something uh, that is not that easy, whereas with RESTful, we already have proven mechanism that works out of the box. And uh, yeah, it, it's not RESTful. It's not RESTful. It's a new way of building APIs and how do we interact with them. So, here, I saw how can I create a GraphQL query from scratch by using GraphQL in package and in node environment and using an express as a web server and be able to see how that works underneath the hood by making an HTTP post request to that GraphQL endpoint and asking the data that you want and you get that as a JSON and for more realistic scenarios, for example, designing an e-commerce, which is very, very common to have nested uh, or very deep nested objects, that uh, with GraphQL queries make it trivial to do that. So our API is now organized in types and fields rather than endpoints. 
So I started to see how can I implement that from scratch, defining its entire system where you set the capability that this GraphQL server will have and also uh, understand uh, two main components, the schema and resolvers and how you can modularize your application to make it much more easy to maintain and scalable. So in the context of schema, the way to do that, okay, to create a scalable graphical server with schema by defining is a GraphQL files with all the types inside of that, right? So you define your query and also is the other relevant type for that feature. And when it comes to resolvers, which this determines the value of a property, uh, you define is a file called or that ends with resolver.ds where it will handle is this API call, not inside of that particular file, because we want to make those resolvers small and thin as much as possible and be independent to whatever model we want to use uh, or database. Uh, in the data layer model, where it's inside of that file, for example, product.model, where you're going to define all of these data access function. Okay? And then I look at how can I create uh, crew operations, create read updates and delete. So far, I saw how can I make read operations Okay, by using query, and if you want to create, update, or delete uh, uh, data in your backend, mutation is the way to do that. Is the GraphQL way to do that? So, again, how can I do that? Well, by defining is in the GraphQL schema where it all begins. Inside of that, you define is this type mutation, which is which is another root level operations uh, so you have query mutations and subscriptions as root type operations okay and inside of the mutations where you define is uh, this cr create update or delete operations that any backend applications deal with right the true operations I also saw I also saw how can I make parameterized queries in the entire pipeline and how to do that by defining is the schema and then inside of the resolvers that where you're going to uh, or set the name of the query and the resolver function, the resolver function uh, the anatomy of the resolver function is the first argument it receive is the argument, uh, the parent, where this comes from the root value, where you define your GraphQL server. The second parameter is the argument, which are data that you define in your parameterized queries. The third uh, parameter is the context, which allow you to share data across the different resolvers, so for example, path authentication data, and to check if a user is logging across all of the resolvers, and the state or the info property, where this indicates the state of your operation. Uh, after I saw that, and how can I create this parameterized query, and then the mutations, and also see how can I implement a mutation, which is under the hood, it was similar to queries. And the important thing is to define is the schema, the resolver, which take care of all of these async operations, and the data layer file that is responsible to handle all of this 
data access layer function, okay? Uh, then look at how can I perform multiple APIs or, or multiple mutations by setting as an alias and something more interesting and more applicable to uh, the industry which is using Apollo this industry standard of GraphQL implementation uh, <laughs> uh, the providing you is the data graph layer or the data layer graph that connects multiple applications to the cloud. Okay, so I also saw that if you want to commit to the servers, you can go to a more advanced features, especially if you want to create a GraphQL project as a part of a much larger team. But most of the time, you're going to see is two main features, the Apollo client and the Apollo server. And this is something that is quite familiar in any uh, software application, right? But you have any software application that connect to others, right? Uh, where you have the client and the server. So the client, Apollo client is a set of front-end libraries that allow you to create GraphQL queries and save data. So much like you will in graphical, uh, where you define these GraphQL queries, instead of uh, sending an HTTP post to a GraphQL endpoint, and also other benefits like caching, network state, or handling loading or error states and data synchronization. Whereas on the Apollo server, this is a way to, that allows to build a GraphQL server in a Node.js environment and provide you other features that or like Run, your, run and deploy your service code in a serviceless environment such as Lambda and implement subscription, which this is something uh, as implement subscriptions. The server sending data to subscriber clients, much like push notifications. So knowing these two things, then I look at how can I implement that in our existing Express application, right? By relying on uh, NPM package from Apollo on the server that allows to do that. See how easy it is to include any mirror here because we make our application very, very modular, and this is another important thing to know. Then I started to look at sockets. And one of the most favorite uh, and, and, and the most interesting thing and the most exciting things uh, on the internet socket. So imagine that you're building a chat app like this course. Or Slack, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Instagram Messenger, you name it. Right? So imagine that you're building a chat app like this course. So using an HTTP to send message is something trivial. Okay? So you can use the post to send message or a get to read all of the message. But how can we notice when a so how can we notice when we receive a message? So you maybe get the message immediately after a post, a couple of hours later, or maybe that person is very excited, so excited to respond after just a few days, right? 
which is what happened with a couple clients or a couple leads in our work, right? It's like, look, it. Next time. Next time. Next time. So when do you ask for a server for a new message? The answer lies in sockets. Let's see how we can do exactly. So how so when do we ask for a server? When yeah, when do we ask for a server for a new message? And the answer lies in socket. And let's see how can we do that what with what we already know. So it all starts with this example. Okay, with socket, uh, and a very, very interesting topic, and in the fundamental of internet socket. Okay. Uh, so, and I really like this approach. Anytime when you're learning something, you, that it be, that it begin with an example, and then. You scale that up to a, um, and then you scale that up to a, a something broader, something uh, the bigger picture, right? And not only that, but you can also use all of this. Uh, copywriting or this paragraph especially when you are going to sell to someone you can say hey yeah I'm going to do this blah, blah, blah. so so on so forth hey. So using HTTP to send a message is something trivial. Okay. So the, the example here began with, uh, imagine that you're building a chat, right? Facebook Messenger, Instagram Messenger, WhatsApp, you name it. So using HTTP to send message is something trivial. But how can we notice when we receive a message? So maybe uh, you get a message immediately after you send the post or a couple hours later or perhaps that person is not excited to reply you and you get that in a few, a few days you get that just after a few days right so how do we ask for data in this case how do we ask for how do we ask the server for new message? And the answer is socket. So anytime we want to know, or anytime we want to ask the server for data that is out of uh, out of a control, so the answer might be socket. In this case, so how can we know when we receive, or how can we know? When we receive a message, uh, the answer lies in socket. Okay, and we're gonna see how can we do that with what we already know. So polling, so in our chat app, we saw this question: when to when to fetch data from the server. Specifically, data that is that is outside of our control, so data that we didn't create. And this might be in their own life cycle, that might be impossible to predict. When somebody wants to chat with us and the message they had sent to us, when somebody when somebody, yeah, when somebody wants to chat with us and the met and the and. Uh, the message they send to us and message when somebody wants to chat with us and the message they send to us
So often we deal with situations like this while fish effectively actually using an approach called polling. Okay? So how can we how can we know or when to fetch data? Okay, because this is timing. When to fetch data from the server, specifically data that is outside of our control, that we didn't create. That is creating asynchronously, right? Mm -hmm. That is creating asynchronously, perhaps by, by another user or another computer. So often we deal with this situation quite effectively, actually, using an approach called polling to know when to fetch data from the server. So what this means is we make a GET request every so often. You just, you just, exactly. So this, what this means is we make a GET request every time so often. You just choose a period of time, and when that time has passed, you may get the request again in a loop, essentially. So the pooling, which is a, uh, quite effectively mechanism on know and uh, on knowing when to fetch data from the server and it means that we may get requests uh, every every so often and in a period of time and when that time ha and when that time has passed uh, we request again essentially uh, in a loop essentially okay so that's polling okay polling here is okay when can we use this when we want to ask uh, for data on the server to know when the server or when to fetch data from the server okay. specifically data that is outside of our control that we didn't create perhaps for another user or another service or a team. So polling often we do with the situation and quite effectively using an approach called polling. So what this means is that we make a get request. So what this means is that we make uh, so what this means is that we make a get request in a period of time and when that time has passed, we make the request again in a loop session. And you do that over and over and over. So you define is the poll right here. Okay. And uh, if you want to get all of this message, you make a fetch to that API. And for the sake of example, I'm just going to abstract all of the fetch and how it works, okay? So this will work and you will get all the message after 500 milliseconds. You may see a couple issues with this approach. How do I choose the right pro how, how do I choose the right period of time? Is there even a right period of time? That's another question. Is there even a right period of time? Does it depend on how often the data change? Does it doesn't doesn't it depend on how often the data change for the backend? So with pooling, often the best we can do is just good enough. So with five millisecond latency, you will add five milliseconds delay for all of your updates in your whole application. This may be good for chat applications, but what about the real stuff, like self-driving cars or trade stock trading or games, okay? So like in Pwn, adding 500 milliseconds like this means that you hit or not the ball. That you hit or not the ball. So 
So for Jaab, it might be okay. okay so for Jaab, it might be okay. But consider this. So we're going to make two requests per second. And multiply that per minute. So we're going about so we're gonna do a uh, 100, uh, 120, yeah, 120 requests per minute. And this is just for one user. And think about now on 10,000 users chatting. So you're going to need a more expensive server for doing sockets to the rescue. So this introduction is to understand is, is that you understand, you're able to understand that, okay, how all of the different things will work and how to make sense of this as well. Uh, on, what, on what sockets, when we can use sockets, when we, when we want to know or when when we want to know uh, so we use sockets when we want to listen for a particular event or when we want to know uh, that a, that a data that is outside of our control receives that on the front okay essentially is when the data when to fetch data from the server okay so Again, all of this huge explanation is understanding uh, from the real life example, like a chat app, and with our understanding, with, with all the things that we know right now, uh, or that I have learned through the entire course, see how can I uh, apply this concept or Specifically, how can we know when to receive message from the server? So polling, okay, is uh, mm -hmm. so uh, here. So for data that is outside of our control, or uh, we didn't create, when to fetch data from the server. Is a uh, is a question that often we deal with this uh, quite effectively, actually, using an approach called polling. Okay, and polling uh, is means that we may get requests so often that on a period of time so when that time has passed we make uh, or you make uh, you make the request again essentially in a loop okay now this might work or this work well for a chat application but this comes with some issues like how do i know uh, the right period of time or is there even a right period of time, you know? Is there even a right period of time? Doesn't it depend on how often the data changes from the backend? So with pooling, often the best we can do is just good enough. Because in our case, adding 500 milliseconds, it will add 500 milliseconds to all updates in your whole app that in chat applications might be good, but for the real stuff like self-driving cars or stock trading uh, or games, when you need to receive constants and up-to-date data, okay, uh, that is not, that's not feasible. But for our example, for a chat app, it might be okay just to make two requests per second. But now, multiply by 60, 
So you get is 120 requests per minute. And this is just one for one user. Imagine that you have 10,000 users chatting. So you're gonna need a powerful server for a different approach. So sockets to the rescue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, so with that, right, that'll be all for this video. Take care, bye-bye.